Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for coming to the media opposition press conference today, January the 12th. Uh, we will have the media opposition on the back of that speak first and present the issues you wish to bring to attention, and then we will, as usual, open the floor for questions. So, uh, thank, thank, you. thank you very, very much, and allow me to wish you uh, a new year fill, filled with health and prosperity. The year has started in, with difficult circumstances for many people. Um, as we speak now, there are still many areas in Region 2 where people are suffering from the consequences of flooding. Yesterday, the, the regional chairman issued a statement documenting his pleas to the government over, at various levels over the past several months to act in a manner that would prepare the region to, for, for a heavy rainfall and the government just ignored his plea, please. And now we are faced with the consequences there. Many people's lives are in turmoil and they're facing um, huge losses. The people in Region 5 also may not have started the year propitiously because the MMA has instituted some of the most draconian increases um, to drainage and irrigation charges for drainage and irrigation charges and land rentals for the rice lands in the scheme as well as the, the pasture lands. So if you look at the increases between profit to Rosignol villages, commonly called the rice fields. The increase on in drainage and irrigation charges has gone from $2,500 to now $8,000 per acre. And for the cattle land, the grazing land, it's gone from $487 to $2,500. For the land rental, that's just DNI charges. Just gone from for rice lands from a thousand dollars to seven thousand dollars, and pasture lands from two hundred dollars to one thousand four hundred dollars. So if you add the two um, for rice lands, the the land charges and the DNI charges will move from three thousand five hundred dollars per acre to fifteen thousand dollars per acre now and for cattle and the pasture lands from four hundred and eighty seven dollars to three thousand nine hundred dollars this will devastate that region a region that relies heavily on agriculture because there are not many other activities to do there there are not government offices we don't have government offices there. There are very few industries in that region. And so they, I'm sure, those people are not looking forward with great joy to the new year because many of them may have to get out of some of these activities. Rice growing, which is already marginal, and, and cattle rearing. And so we can expect um, serious problems for those communities. The, the miners also, particularly small miners, are faced with this year, now that the, the laws have been rushed through, as you saw in the parliamentary debate, and none of our concerns that we raised there were, were taken into, was, was taken into consideration. Um, con we had suggested reduction of rates or removal of some of the proposed taxes by the minister, 
but the government was intransigent on that. And so now they will have to pay a 100% increase in the tributous taxes, 100%, moving from 10 to 20% or um, that's tributous tax. So that's a 100% increase. And many of those small miners will be now, small medium scale miners will now be subjected to the full um, personal income tax or corporate tax if they're incorporated. Um, in the past, they had a 2% final tax that they paid. And if they don't keep records, they can go to jail for six months, many of those small miners. The loggers are not faced with um, a, a much better situation. I had word from a group in Kwakwani and Aichuni that they're faced with ruin. They have logs they can't sell. Um, they they don't have much mo any any other source of employment there, so the situation is there in those areas too. Linda and Aichuni, Kwakwani. Um, many other groups have been coming to see me, talking to me about the situation. Uh, a group of businessmen came to see me to ask about the currency, and um, in spite of the the assurances given by the government, the reality on the ground is there is a shortage. That's the reality. If people can't, the market is not clearing for one reason or another. It's either the banks are hoarding the currency, and if that is so, they should be identified which bank, which bank is doing so, or, or, uh, or there is a shortage. There is a mismatch between supply and demand. And it's as simple as that. Once you have a queue, something is wrong there. So the attempt to, to assure the country without dealing with the reason for the queue in the, in the banking system now, when people go and they can't get as little as $2,500, $3,000 they can't get. They have to join a line. And there is a problem there. And the government needs to address, to take its head out of the sand, because it's been there for a long time, and address these issues, many, many of these issues. Um, we have not yet seen the full pass-through of the the large number of taxes that they have imposed in the last budget, and those will have a huge um, impact on cost of living and for the disincentive to, to growth and development. Um, I've seen the head of SARU um, again sticking his mouth into the, into the public debate. And so now the latest, the latest um, position is that they're mapping all the tall buildings in Georgetown to, uh, to see people's sources of income. And that the central bank somehow was deficient because it did not look at the, the flow through of money through the, the banking system. And you know, because they did not do due diligence on customers, the central bank and the commercial banks. Well, this gen gentleman has a tendency to call figures off the top of his head. Do you recall just after they took office, in fact, just before that, he spoke about nearly half a billion dollars of illicit flows and that it attributed it to government corruption. Now, I would like to see what the figure for illicit flows um, or the figures for illicit flows are today. 
because if it was attributable to, to corruption in the past, it has to be attributable to the same reason today. But he called a figure because he extracted it from some website. You'd recall the same gentleman speaking with Golsoran about how 28 to 35 percent of pro, um, the, the money for public procurement was stolen through procurement fraud. That runs into over $40 billion, given the size of our procurement budget. It's gone quiet on that. And now he's been talking about illegal money in our banking system. And somebody should ask him, have you quantified this? Or is it just you talking nonsense again? And the reason I, why I am so upset with this, the president needs to look at this, that these loose-mouthed people are damaging our economy. He, the, the business community and ordinary citizens operate on signals. If the entire government speaks as though it hates investments and investors, and if you put up a building, you'll be subjected to a whole range of scru scrutiny by the government. They're just going to withdraw. They're not going to invest. They're not going to want to, they're not going to have confidence in our economy. I hope that the president curbs all these people who are damaging the prospects for, for our economy. So what's the logic of a tall building? So assuming you have one, three, five-story building, or 50 one-story building. What's the logic of, of, of this? And also, he's going to map the one five-story building that you have, and you're subjected to investigation, when other, another person has 50 properties around the city, but they're not tall buildings. There's no logic to it. And, and this was the person who was on the board of directors of Globe Trust when it collapsed. And if anything, the central, when the central bank wrote the Globe Trust about the insolvency of that institution, they, they continued to take depositors' money, small people's money. He has no clue about managing the economy. And he's damaging the prospects for Guyana and for our people, the creation of jobs, income, and a, and a future that we all would like to share, a, a future of increased prosperity. And I do hope that the, the president looks into this. I said it before. I said that sometimes you can get everything right, but if the signals are wrong about your intent, then people act on signals. And investors do so, as well as ordinary citizens. And so we, I don't have much hope that they would listen because of the arrogance of some, of some of these people, some of them in government. They don't listen to the concerns of ordinary people. They wouldn't walk around the markets anymore. They used to when they were campaigning. No longer walk around the markets anymore and listen to the concerns of, of ordinary people. So I do not want to spend much more time on the economy, but from all I've seen, we're in for a rough year. We're in for a rough year. And people, they will be taking in taxes close to $40 billion more out of our pockets, the people of this country. Secondly, um, in relation to the appointment of the chairman of GCOM, I have been, um, I've been very cautious about commenting in the public or in joining the public debate on this issue because I thought that some of the, the confusion and the noise, the extraneous 
um, issues that have surrounded this matter could have been avoided had we dealt with each other in a more professional manner. So I learned of the president's view from a media brunch that he had when he explained his position to the media without even informing me about the list, his list. And the president says he's not playing politics. But I thought that that was a political act because it was done on a Sunday at a media brunch. And he knew that by the time we got around to addressing the issue, because I could not have addressed the issue until I had formal notification from him that an impression would be created that somehow my list that I submitted to him did not meet the constitutional requirements. And if you look at media stories as well as the online comments, these will substantiate my view that many people, after listening to the president on the Sunday, by the time I got around to responding to the issue, being formally notified and responding to the issue, they had already created some truths in their mind, some impressions about the issue. So I've been, I've been trying to, to address some of these, talking to people. But I want to do so again here today because there is, let's start with the Constitution because I've seen this mentioned several times, particularly online. There is a whole deal of confusion about whether the fit and proper section of that constitution, of our current constitution, was deleted or is still in the constitution. And these are people who are smart people, but they are being totally confused. So I want to, you to refer to the Constitution of the Cooperative Republic of Ghana Act, 1980. In 19, this Constitution, the 1980 Constitution, it's uh, Article 161.1, um, Article 161.2. This is what it says. Subject to the provisions of Paragraph 6, the chairman of the Elections Commission shall be appointed by the president from among persons who hold or have held office as a judge of a court, having unlimited jurisdiction in civil and criminal matters in some part of the Commonwealth, or a court having jurisdiction in appeals from any such court, or who is qualified to be appointed as any such judge, full stop. So the 1980 Constitution does two things. It gives the president the right to appoint in his own, discre at his own discretion. And it says that there's one category of persons, or two categories, either judges or people who are qualified to be judges could be appointed. This is the 1980 Constitution. The, the 90, the, the, our current Constitution says, subject to the provision, and this is the applicable one, so I need to show you. 
so just those people who are online and who have called me saying, apparently they're, they're reading the old constitution, that this one says, subject to the provisions of paragraph four, the chairman of the elections commission shall be a person who holds or who has held office as a judge of a court having unlimited jurisdiction in civil and criminal matters in some part of the Commonwealth, or a court having jurisdiction in appeals from any such court, or who is qualified to be appointed as any such judge, or any other fit and proper person to be appointed from, by the president from a list of six persons, non unacceptable to the president submitted by the leader of the opposition. So from that constitution, words were included now, or any other fit and proper person. Now, even a layman would understand that the intent here, the intent was to broaden the categories from which people could be appointed. So the old constitution said only these categories appointed by the president in his sole, at his sole discretion. The new one now adds in the fit and proper definition. It extends it. Clearly, this is clear to me. Because the president says he is clear, the constitution is clear. But this is quite clear to me too. So we have a, a different view that outside of judges uh, or people qualified to be appointed judges, others can be appointed to the post. Now, practice, practice will also show that this definition was understood, or this article was understood in the manner I just described by several of the originators of list, list particularly Mr. Hoyt. Mr. Desmond Hoyt, submitted four, and he was a senior counsel. Desmond Hoyt submitted four lists. In 94, 97, 2001, and 2002. And as we have seen, there are several people on those lists who are not judges or do not have the or who, are not, who are not judges or did not have the qualification to be judges. In fact, the names that came out or who were selected from the list submitted by Mr. Hoyt was, were Hopkinson, Dudnat Singh, he had the requisite qualification, Joe Singh, Steve Serge Bali. If the president is saying, uh, I, I think this is a huge uh, embarrassment of, of Mr. Desmond Hoyt to say that he, as a senior counsel, that he did not understand the Constitution. He did not understand this particular provision of the Constitution. And now the president, with all due respect, a, a good historian, better understands the Constitution or this provision of the Constitution than Mr. Desmond Hoyt, senior counsel. So we will, let's go back now. Now that we are clear that the Constitution, the current Constitution provides as far as we are concerned for a list 
list of people who are not necessarily judges or qualified to be judges, um, that they have a, a right to be submitted. And we submitted our list in accordance with that interpretation of the Constitution. So the list that I sent that has these names on them, we believe that that list is in accordance with the Constitution. I've seen Chronicle and the others saying I misread the Constitution and did not submit the list in accordance with the Constitution. That's our interpretation. It's born by history, born out by history, as well as that interpretation I gave you, the clear intent that when the amendment was made from the 1980 Constitution to the current one. So that's clear. The president said he is not playing politics. So if we have a difference of views, he's yet to define, the president is yet to, to tell me clearly, because what he said at the media brunch implied that he was sticking narrowly to that definition, the old definition in the old constitution, or the old, the old article in the old constitution. But in his letter to me, his letter said the names do not seem, do not seem to conform with Article 161 2 of the Constitution. So that is why I have sought clarity. If he said they did not seem to conform, then I need from the President clarity about why they did not seem to conform. Is it because of what he said at the media branch, which implied that he was going with the old constitution, or is there any other reason why these names do not seem to come conform? Because these are six eminently qualified people we would release with their permission, if we can get that, their CVs. And you will see that these are people we believe who can, every single one of them in their own right, can be good, impartial chairpersons of, of GCOM, or chairperson of GCOM. So we've written seeking clarity. I have also asked for an urgent meeting. I noticed the president saying that they are going to give clarity, that it has entered into the legal realms now. It was always in the legal realm. But I sought a meeting because I thought that the president would then be, would then benefit from another view, another legal view, apart from the one that he may be getting from his attorney general, who has given flawed advice on many, many occasions. And so I thought that if we had that meeting, and the president heard the other arguments and can review the history that he will conclude that the view that he expressed publicly on this matter, that it may not be correct. And just assuming after hearing us he still holds to that view, and since he is not playing politics, since the president is not playing politics, and he wants to find a way forward, 
he will have to, I'm sure he understands that he can't be the person who interprets the Constitution, that the courts interpret our Constitution, our Constitution and our laws, our courts do that, not the president, he is part of the executive. That I would have proposed to him, and since I may not get this meeting, so I am I'm saying what I would have suggested at the meeting, if after pointing these arguments out to him, he still held on to his original view, I would have proposed to him that we jointly approach the Caribbean Court of Justice to get an interpretation of our, our, the, the, our, this article 161.2 of our Constitution. So that is what I was hoping to come out of the meeting. But it's quite interesting that twice the president invited me to meetings, once the first as a courtesy call, and I went, and the second time to, to consult when the um, your ch act, acting chief justice, on the, on the appointment of the acting chief justice, and, and I went there. That in oh, almost two years, I've never requested a meeting of the president. And I've now requested a meeting to deal with personal issues a matter that is so important for our country. And he, he does not want to meet on the matter. And this is the president that speaks about what comes to parliament and tells us in every one of his spe speeches that we must work together. We must seek a greater understanding, collaboration, and, uh, and speaks about social cohesion. So I believe the president is playing politics. He is playing politics here. And so that is, is my view on the matter. If you, if you look again, because there is another view on the matter about whether the president can appoint um, unilaterally, because the attorney general has on numerous occasions, I've, I've seen him, it is entirely at the discretion of the president. The constitution gives him th that power to determine who is, fit, uh, who is a fit and proper person. And that sort of thing, and, uh, and then he says that the president can, um, he's the decision maker. So implying that he could, you, he, look, uh, then further, of course at all material times he acts in his own deliberate judgment. All of these implying, implying that they have a view that at some point in time, if this matter persists, that the president can, on his, at his own discretion, appoint a chairman of GCOM. And the Constitution says here, I'm reading the same article that goes on, um, 161.2, provided that if the leader of the opposition fails to submit a list as provided for, the president shall appoint a person who holds or has held office as a judge. So if I failed to submit a list. Now, the thing is that we have submitted the, the, the list. This was designed, I think, to ensure that, that you can move forward just in case one party decides not to participate in the process. Because we have seen that happening from time to time. And you couldn't have an institution like GCOM um, without a chairman if one party refused to participate. So that was designed for that purpose. 
And so we are, the president has written to us about another list. At this point in time, I'm seeking clarification from him that he promised to give. We may agree with the clarifications. We may find that, or we may not. And at that point in time, we will then decide. Um, I, I will still be seeking the meeting with the president. Um, and then we will decide how to proceed on the matter. And it may very well, if they end up in the courts, if the president doesn't want to go jointly, we may have to go to the court to seek an interpretation of this article. But this right now, I'm hoping that if the president is not playing politics, I'm going to take him at his word, um, and that he's genuinely interested in, in moving forward. We are too, and we want the best person to, to be the chairperson of GCOM. A person who is impartial, who can act in that manner, who can withstand pressure from one side or the other to act in an unprofessional manner. I think that the current names that I've submitted all, all bear, bear that hallmark. Um, I will stop here at this time. Thank you very much. our first press conference for 2017, although there have been press statements that have been issued from the Lady Opposition Office. This is our first actual press conference for the year, and therefore uh, there are a lot of issues that have been uh, raised, and so we'll open the floor for discussions as usual, normal protocols obtained, and that is your name and the agency you're representing. And uh, I'll be like the speaker. If I see you, who I see first. <laughs> OK. Yes. Sorry, you said that the president is refusing to meet with you. Uh, could you say if this was uh, related to you in a letter or? No, no, no. Um, this is my first instance, and I've not received a letter, just like how the president, um, he spoke at the State House um, about this matter in relation to my letter. He gave his position publicly. Well, I wrote him. I've now received a reply saying, yes, um, there will be a meeting. And, uh, but I've seen him publicly say, say that there will be clarifications. So I'm still hoping that the meeting will be on so that we can receive the clarifications at the meeting. I'm hoping his understanding is not that he will write me a letter giving the clarifications. Because we... Any other questions? Uh, sir, there are those that were always two names on the list. I mean, you spoke about uh, the need for the non-partisanship, and it's something that's not the least. But two persons in the list, uh, Ryan Shaw and James Rose. Uh, Mr. Rose has had uh, some sort of, uh, sort of made open statements about the support of your party, and uh, Mr. Shaw as well is yes. as a member of yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Sorry, Mr. Shaw also is someone who has expressed some sort of, some sort of political affiliation. Sir, is it that you waned on the need for non-partisanship? Um, I I've seen Ms. Shaw um, being very critical of the People's Progressive Party too. She's not a member of the People's Progressive Party. James Rose is not a member of the People's Progressive Party. And the 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 this brings me to something else that I will, I will deal with in a moment. But if the pre that's the president's contention, if that's the president's contention that two of your nominees are, don't, do not meet the definition of fit and proper, then he could easily indicate that. 
because I'm not clairvoyant. I can't, I can't see what's in the president's mind if I do not get an explanation. So is that the reason? Uh, is he claiming that the reason why um, he doesn't find the list acceptable because two persons on the list are, are seen as political? If I get that clarity from the president or, or, or clarification, then I can easily address those issues. But I'm not any clearer because he said at the media brunch about this thing about judges or former judges or those to be, who can become judges, giving the nation the impression that he's going back to the 1980 constitution. And, and then I saw something slightly different from his attorney general. So that is all I'm asking, asking of the president, you know, to get the, this sort of clarification. Then I, that could easily be remedied because it, it, it is reasonable and then I can address it. But I cannot address something if I don't know what he's thinking. And, and this is why I'm seeking, seeking clarity from him. So just for my own clarification, you, you received no indications yet as to what the meeting will happen? No, no indication. Yeah. Not unacceptable. Yeah. Constitution yes. says not unacceptable. So not acceptable. I just I just dealt with the the issue there because if he is saying that the reason right the reason for the rejection is that three names may not be acceptable to the president, then if I'm aware of that, I can then address the issue. Yeah. But if we are listening, if we take him at face value, he is he's implying that I must somehow tra do some astral travel, go into the head of the president, and find out how he will assess this fit and proper. So either that or I should give him a list, the voters list, and he should take off all the names on the voters list that he will find acceptable. And then I will select from, or fit and proper, and then I will select from one of those names on the voters list. Uh, this is our Attorney General. No, I don't know. I don't. I don't know. Can you say what action the party will take if the president moves ahead to unilaterally appoint the chief of We will deal with that. At I don't. I don't. The president has said he is interested in engaging. He doesn't want to play politics with this issue, and I. I, I applaud him for this. Let's hold him to his own words. And I hope that through the process of engagement that, that we will reach a solution that is acceptable to all the parties because that was the purpose of the Carter formula. Three from the government, three from the opposition, and a chairman selected in a process, through a process, that gives comfort to both parties. If you do that, what the president, or what you're claiming could happen, if the president selects one person unilaterally, it upsets the balance that was, the, the, the formula was designed to achieve. Thank you, Duncan, thank you. Um, I 
I know you are the opposition uh, on meeting with the president is being urgent. Is there an anticipated time frame that you know you would let the president to engage in the time? This evening. This evening. This evening. <laughs> yes, whenever. <laughs> Huh? Do you think it's time that the Carter formula This I gather that there is well with Nagamoto you're never sure. I must insert that. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> that there is a process for constitutional reform that would be initiated. They set aside a lot of money. We hope the money is not like doesn't go on food and travel alone. <laughs> but there'd be real consultations. <laughs> and um and that issue can come up there and be debated. We, we will participate in the debate. But right now, right now, that issue is not relevant. That's for the future. We have constitution that is clear in its intent. That's why I showed you how it evolved from the 1980 constitution to the current one that there was clear, clear, clear intent to change it. And Mr. Hoyt, who submitted four lists as senior counsel, understood it the way we, we understand it. Yeah, imagine the president himself um, was on one of those lists. Right, and um, he was a member of the PNC for a very long time. How, how, how long has he been a member? How many? 40. 40 years. So when Mr. Hoyt submitted his name and he accepted to get to, for his name to be on that list, he knew he was a member of the PNC and that he had no legal qualification. Uh, and, and still, today speaks about a different view, that it may have been breached at that time. Did, so did he participate willingly in an, uh, an, an exercise that breached the Constitution? I don't think it was a breach. I think Mr. Hoyt was smart enough and a legally trained mind to, to understand the provision of the Constitution. Mr. Jagger, you're saying it's very fine. It's very fine that um, Mr. Granger, at that time, when his name, when his name was submitted, he was a member of the I, That's why I just asked Gail to share, and she said, 40 years, 40 <laughs> years, <laughs> Gail. <laughs> <laughs> I just asked. No, please go back and check your I, records I, I, about I, when. No, I just wanted to. No, uh, no, no, I just asked. When so that's where, because his name mean? was not 40 years ago. Uh, the name was submitted yeah, just. Around the 2000. Yes, about 2000, about 16 years. Yeah. So if he was a member 40 years ago, that's what I heard. Then, mm -hmm. yes. Remember his role. He, that was mentioned in his qualifications as a president. Huh? Yeah, and launch his campaign. campaign All right. Well, I'm I'm being advised. <laughs> so, so in case anything, I'm blaming. <laughs> because remember, it was also for the army, the ideological person so, in the army. In but states. but this this is a grave matter. It is a grave matter. If people can determine to interpret any law, any constitution by itself, or any anything by itself, and then um and proceed to, to act on the basis of their own interpretation. What do we have? What would we have in this country? We have already have had some cases of executive lawlessness. And, and by the way, I, a number of people have been calling me to say that the non-appointment of the judges um, is designed to achieve a particular outcome that if these judges are appointed, this is what I'm told, then they will be senior and can stake a claim to, for, 
to the post, the vacant post of Chief Justice and Chancellor, which will be be very very soon. So that they are being their appointment is being deliberately delayed to allow the identified person who will go to, to who will fill one of these posts to be appointed at the same time so that that person will have seniority or will have e equal seniority with those who are appointed. And so that it is part of playing politics with our judiciary. It's, it's designed to get a particular person who might be junior now, because if these appointments go forward, will become junior to the, the current judges or some of the current judges who are to be appointed. So it will then raise the question, why not go with the most senior person? So even that is a problem too. But of course we have not um, had any big issue from the, the media following it up, following up this, this question. I hope you will ask the president if that's the objective. Uh, which drug procurement? I've, I've, I've not read. I've not read the report. I don't think I have the report. We, we don't have a, a copy of it. Okay, you are telling Monday. Are you questioning? Is that a question or a statement? <laughs> I'm guessing to something. So, yes, please. So, um, could you now talk to us of your role as leader of the opposition and your replacing this role with an individual on the press conference? We will be having a press conference on Monday um, for the People's Progressive Party, at which I'm sure these questions, you will be free to ask those questions yeah. there. Uh, and, and, and Mr. Jagge will be leading. Right. The <laughs> I had not <laughs> intended to. <laughs> but I, I want to deal extensively um, at the first, at least at the first press conference with issues surrounding the party yeah. on Monday. So I will, um, I will attend that press conference, but I will not be holding a press conference as general secretary every Monday. That is, I will not, the party will have a press conference, but I will not be the presenter there on many occasions. We have a large, huge number of leaders who will be representing the party at these press conferences um, there. So I will talk a bit more about that on Monday. You mentioned that 2017 will be a rough year for um, Guyanese, but moving away from the economy, can you comment on the still escalating incidents of crime and any updates on the meeting on sugar that was held in November? The crime situation, um, it's, what, what, what do I say? It's like almost, We've been, we've been talking about it. It is re causing devastation in people's lives. There are many people come to my office. Um, if I have to relate all the personal stories that I hear of neglect and arrogance on the part of the minister too. You saw, you saw him. Um, he said, one, I can't do anything about the law. It's 2 a.m., that's the law. 2 a.m. curfew, that's a law. It's not about the minister. Then for the Christmas season, he breaks the law. 
he relaxes it. Suddenly it's the minister who relaxes it. And now suddenly he is back to, I will take away your licenses if you open beyond 2 a.m. It's a, the silliest thing I've ever seen. We need, well, amend the law. We will support the amendment of the law. We don't support noise nuisance and stuff like that. If people want to open their business premises, they must make ensure that they don't disturb the public or their neighbors. But we have, we're not a regimented society. People, if they want the clubs to operate until five in the morning and they have the license to do so, or, or, or we should give them the license to do so. And allow our people to, to have those freedoms. If, he, if it's a law, then bring the law to the, to, to the National Assembly and we will support them in amending it. And it has nothing to do with the spate of crime across the country. So people have been coming, a lot of them have been coming and talking about the callous behavior or at various levels. We are always supportive of the police and the army. And let me just say, that let me apologize to the army because there was a post. I don't manage my Facebook page. And there was a post from one of my administrators which said that the army was in Red House or was part of the team that went into Red House to break the signs down. That's far from the truth. The army did not participate in that activity, nor did the police. None of the members of the discipline forces. In fact, so far, they have operated professionally on that matter. And so I had, from the time it was drawn to my attention, I had that post taken down. And it's the first occasion I have now to say um, that it was not true. It was not true. Um, so the, the security forces have been trying, they're operating as professionally in many, many cases, but this government is clueless about what it wants to do. And it sends all the wrong signals. And so uh, the, the crime situation will go unabated whilst they take away a significant part of the investigative capacity of the police force to run after political opponents. So up to today's paper, I saw um, Saru, not Saru, Soku, saying that they have not been able to get through this large number of cases. Uh, but why? They were set up to go after money laundering, drug trafficking, etc., to be a supportive arm of the FIU but they have now been redirected to go after political opponents. So a significant part of the government's capability, imagine they have put in the, the attorney general's chambers illegally $100 million to pay special prosecutors to go after political opponents, and they can't even find and pay proper prosecutors to go after murderers and criminals and, uh, 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 and people, rapists, etc. People who steal from, from others. They can't find money to do that. It shows where they're heading, that it's all about politics. They're, they're, they're shifting the focus of the security forces to, to go after political opponents. And so this year, I expect that they will, as they get more desperate, as the economy tanks, as they lose support across the country, including in their own base, they are going to get more repressive and, and lash out, and I expect more actions against politicians. But we are prepared for it. We are prepared for it. And I know it is a big concern of this country about the signals they're hearing about rigged elections, because that's a fear of many people. They believe that given the PNC's history, 
and that a significant part of the actors of the past are in the current government, that there will be a consorted attempt and a sophisticated attempt to rig the next elections. And so let me assure them that this party, the People's Progressive Party, one of its primary focuses will be on that issue. And so we are already working internationally. We will be doing a lot of work internationally to get international eyes on Guyana. Secondly, we are going to expose any attempt to tamper with the process. We have concerns about Felix, and we have expressed those already about the birth certificates, about the potential possibility of tampering there. We have concerns about GCOM and the machinery there, headed by, by Lowenfield, who has acted partisan in a partisan manner in this case, in, a, in, the, in the petition that we have. And so we are going to look at anything that's coming out of the continuous registration to see that it's not being tampered with, nor the list that is there, that it's not being tampered with. We are aware that a few people have gone underground, missing. You don't see them. I don't want to call their names from Apnu Camp. And that they are busy working on, on, on issues. So we're going to look at all of those matters. So don't think we are walking. I want to assure the country, do not think that we are not aware of the concerns of the populace. Or we are going to just lie down, roll over, and give up. We are going to look at every single issue that they may attempt to use in, in falsifying the results of the next election. No. As far as I'm, I know, Red House has not been vacated. Um, the, the board had a meeting on Tuesday. And, and so I hope that, because there is a difference between the People's Progressive Party, and many people believe that the People's Progressive Party own the Red House. We have given solidarity and support to the Red House Board and to that Research Institute, Solidarity. It so happens that some of the members of our leadership are members of the board, but you do have people who are not members of the party who are on the board too. You do have people. So that's one. But Chedi Jagan's legacy is a national treasure, is a national treasure. And I heard the president speak about how he had discussions with the People's Progressive Party um, for other presidents being involved here. The president never had any discussion with the People's Progressive Party about this matter. Never. That, that is for the board to answer, but they've never discussed this matter. He said in his media brunch that he has had discussions with the People's Progressive Party, that the government has had discussions with the PPP. They've never had any discussion with the People's Progressive Party, the government. <coughs> but, but why do they want they have so many other facilities that they can use for other presidents in this country that we will willingly support if they want something to, to, for Burnham. Then why not just do it? Why not just do it? Why do you have to take away from the Ch 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 Chedi Jagan's legacy? Why not just add? And, and particularly how we treated how the People's Progressive Party treated former presidents, especially the two the leaders who were there in the pre-independence era. 
I've gone, been on record before saying how we treated their family. Five acres of, of land in the city freehold title in the garden for without them paying a cent. That they got freehold. They turned around and sold this at a, a huge sum of money and benefited from it. In this case, even the lease is was five cents or 10 cents per year. The property remained that of the state. There was no attempt to take the property away from the state. Contrast the two. In this case, we handed over five acres of prime land in the city to the Burnham family and with a transport to the land. Here, in this case, we just leased, or when I say we, I mean the Red House Board leased the, the, the property, but it remained the property of the state. They, clearly, people must understand the difference. But would the PPP would have supported what the president wanted? Would you support that to make um, Red House? But, but, but why Red House? That's what the first thing I will ask, like to ask the president. We don't, I don't want to get into hypotheticals, but I'd say, why Red House? Why not take, why not take the Castellani House? But I mean, you're getting into theoretical issues. There was a motion passed yes. in the parliament at the time of Chetty's anniversary as an MP. At the most, two critical motions were passed in the ninth parliament of historic importance. And that is the motion on Cherry Jagan, which was jointly supported unanimously, and the one on Burnham as a parliamentarian, which was also jointly supported unanimously and worked on together. In you know, the Burnham motion, there is the issue of having a home for presidents and the artifacts of presidents. There has been no follow-up after that by the PNC ever since that of proposing, because that was an understanding that, you know, come up with some places. They yeah. never did. Never but did. And that was from, from 2008, 2009. So that the PNC has an interest in their presence, we understand. Yeah. The mausoleum has been there all the time. It has been supported by taxpayers. It has been taken care of. No one has ever desecrated the mausoleum for Burnham. And it's in the botanical gardens. It's public property, state property. No one has ever dreamed of doing that. Why do that to Red House? Okay. All right. Sir, sir, if I, uh, Thank you. Um, could you say if you had opposed the leasing of the Red House? At any I, 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 I ne ne never, it? never. In, my, in the period when I was there, Red House received the full support, my full support. During, your yeah, during my presidency. Sir, received it. But this it? is part of, again, an attempt to sow division. You know, that somehow um, I don't support either Chetty Jagan's legacy or I had a difference in view on Red House. We have one view that they, we support the Red House being a research center for uh, with, with Chetty Jagan's works housed there, a research center for the whole country. I was told that even President Granger went there to do research on a few occasions by the staff there. <clears throat> and that that and that it remains in the it still remains a property of the state. Sir, Thank you. Could you say if, if, if the lease allows for occupation of the actual building or a house or if it's just a property? Why don't you ask the members of the board? Because I don't want I'm not a member of the board, but the People's Progressive Party support the Red House board, yeah. Can I just ask about the, uh, the <coughs> Facebook post that was deleted? Uh, sir, was, was the person brought, um, was there any reprimanding of that person? I mean, that's a serious allegation. To me. Yeah, the, they saw a video, they told me they saw a video of someone there from the army. Mm -hmm. But if that person was there, that person did not, might have been intelligence, army intelligence but they did not participate in the breaking down of the sign. Mm. Those were talks sent by Office of the President. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much.